Wait, is this just gate? Chapter 83 Written by Pepper Antique Amina sat in the summoning room with Keeler watching James talk to his commander. She still couldn't understand what the colonel was saying, but she could occasionally pick up a word or two. She and James had been continuing with their slow, but steadily improving, medallion-free conversations with each other every night. But she was still far from being fluent in English. Keela, meanwhile, was just sitting idly and drinking her tea. Yes, m'm. James said as he paced back and forth a few steps at a time. Yes, m'm, I understand that. Yes. No, I won't, m'm, it'll be fine. He turned and paced a bit more. He'd been walking circles like this for nearly thirty minutes now. I don't exactly have a choice, m'm. Yes, I'm certain. James continued like this for another twenty minutes or so. Then he let out a long, deep, sigh. And concluded with, I understand, m'm. I'll make sure it happens. Then the phone lit up as the call disconnected from the other side. James held the phone out like it was about to attack him. Then he took a deep breath and let out another long sigh as he put it back in his pants pocket. What did she say? Keeler asked after a moment. Well. James said as he looked back up. She's not happy. Also, this is gonna be less of a trip for me and more of an assignment. How do you mean? Amina asked this time. He looked at her and smiled. Well with any luck, I'll be able to call home at any point during the trip. That's good at least. He pulled out and looked at his phone, reading a message that had just chimed in. Got a prep for another delivery to arrive. The door should open some time later tonight. He said absently. Well. Keeler said as they all began walking toward the door. That should give us some time to arrange the trip. Yeah. James replied as Amina took his hand. Yeah eh? A few hours later James and Amina were sitting at the table in her room eating dinner. He was looking at articles about lizard and snake mating and birthing on his phone. He focused specifically on Komodo dragons and various vipers, since they were what Steve and Maxwell most reminded him of visually. He thanked the nerds of the world for the internet. How'd the searches go today? He asked as he ate a bite of Smepli. His face scrunched from the sour flavor. Not great. She admitted. The shopkeep we were set to question this morning somehow conveniently went on vacation a few days ago. First one he'd gone on in years according to his neighbors. Her eyebrow raised upon noticing his face. Hum, weird. He said. Coincidence? After the missing dock records the day before. And the burnt down tavern in Midtown. I'm starting to think not. She said. James just grunted acknowledgement as he hurriedly threw a pinch of salt in his mouth. They ate in silence for a few moments. After it had grown a touch awkward James interrupted. You're not coming along are you? He asked. Amina sat for a moment, thinking, before she answered. No. She said sadly. Not immediately anyways. Your father doesn't want you in the open now that he knows someone is trying to kill you. Less of a question than a statement. He won't say as much. But no. She answered. Jixel says that the trip will take almost three weeks. He said. Then it'll probably be nearly two months before Maxel lays her eggs. He rested his head on his hand and looked out the window. Maybe three, though she doubts it. Almost six months before I'll be back. Yes. She agreed. I'll be continuing to monitor the investigation. Plus I'll be overseeing the improvements to castle security. She took a deep breath and placed a hand on his arm, shaking it lightly. I'll try to be there before long though. He thought for a moment, not looking at her, before saying. I don't know that I want you to. What? She asked, unsure of whether she'd heard correctly. I said, I don't know if I want you to. Amina. He replied, looking down at her hand as he placed his other hand over it and sat up. But. She began. Why not? 
James winced a little at the hurt that he heard in her voice. Because I don't want you to get killed either. He replied. But I dash, she began, but he cut her off. Amina I know. He said. I know you can handle yourself. Hell I've seen you fight. I know that. And that shield is only gonna make you better. And if Danik gets your eye working then you'll be even better. By the way, how is it going with Danik anyways? He asked. It's good. She said, forcing a smile. It's a little less blurry, but still not great. Good. He said, also smiling. If you know that I can handle myself then why won't you let me go? She asked. James exhaled, then he turned and took both her hands in his and looked her in the eyes. Amina. He said. I can't let you do anything. I'll never let you do anything. She looked at him in confusion, she was about to speak when he continued. How do I word this? He asked himself. I don't want you to go. He admitted. I fought my ass off trying to keep you alive. Almost died myself while doing it. He hung his head. I don't want to be afraid like that again. But I also can't stop you from doing what you want. And I never will. You wouldn't? She asked, confused again. But you just said you don't want me to go? And I don't. He agreed. I don't want some evil shadow hitman monster society to kill you. He looked her in the eye again. But I'll also admit that if I'm down at this. Clutching preserve. Or whatever Jixel called it, and you come walking into my tent, I'll be the happiest guy in the area. So you do want me to go? She asked. Look. I don't know how to explain my feelings about it, okay? James exclaimed, then he sighed. Amina I want you with me pretty much all the time. There's nothing I want more than for you to come with me all over this world. He shook his head lightly. Phrasing. But still. I want you to travel with me. But I don't want you to get hurt. And I know that as a soldier you're used to being in danger anyways. So am I. Especially here. He practically yelled. He was stressed, and talking very fast now. But I don't want you to die. Especially if it happens in a way that I can't at least try to pre-dash. He stopped suddenly as Amina grabbed his shirt and pulled him across the table and kissed him. After a few seconds, she pulled back and looked him in the eyes. I'm going. She said forcefully. I want to. I just have to finish the investigations first. And let my dad wind down. Okay. He said simply. He pulled her back down and kissed her again. But if you end up dying I'm gonna have Vilairi raise you back up so I can scold you for it. He joked. Amina grinned. If I die and you don't, then I'll haunt you. She joked right back. As he settled back into the chair, ignoring the food that was now on his shirt, he reached out and held her hand again. Don't make me worry too much. He said. I could say the same to you. She said with a devilish grin. You seem to find trouble every time you touch a bottle. She admonished him. James didn't tell her what he thought about her joke. He didn't tell her that she'd haunt him whether it was literal or not. Instead he just smiled at her and began taking his shirt off. Bits of food scattered all over the table as he did, and he whipped the shirt towards her, resulting in a slice of smeply hitting her on the cheek. She laughed, and the sound of her laughter drove his worries away. But only a little bit. Just an hour after they'd finished dinner, and while they were in bed together, an attendant had knocked on Amina's door. She'd rushed to put on a nightgown, while James had wrapped up in the blankets. James's delivery was waiting for him. When they got there he found several large hard plastic crates, a garment bag, rucksack, and a duffel bag all waiting for him. V. Lyrie was there with one of the other mags looking at the items curiously. There was also, he noticed, a rifle case. Damn. He said as he walked up. They went all out. Biggest shipment they've sent yet. V. Lyrie said without even looking at him. 
they're getting better at opening the door. It was larger than the last few times. It seemed more stable too. Cool. James said as he knelt by one of the plastic crates. So they are working their way up to people-sized openings. He thought. But he kept that to himself. He opened the crate, ignoring Vilairi as she peered over his shoulder. Inside were a bunch of small, round circles, with little propellers in the middle. The largest of them was only maybe three inches across, and the smallest was barely larger than a quarter. They all had little tiny claw-like legs on the bottom. In a slot to the side was a tablet that he knew controlled the small drones. Yea for work. He said sarcastically. As he did he slid over to the rifle case and opened up it. Vilairi was still looking at the drones. He was thankful, since this was about to be kind of funny. He pulled the rifle out, surprised to find that the army had splurged on getting him a brand new one, or so it seemed. He held the rifle up in the air. Hey Vel. He said. She turned and looked at him, her eyes widening a bit at the sight of the rifle in his hands. This is a rifle. He said with a smile. 